Um, so my name is Konrad Kaminski. I work for Allegro. So we are the largest Polish e-commerce um, company. And today I'd like to talk about coatings in Kotlin and reactive programming. Um, so first, I want to ask you one question. So how many of you actually know Kotlin, the language? So you have read something about it or maybe have done something? Yeah, okay, a couple of you, right? Uh, how about coatings? Do you know anything about coatings in Kotlin? All right, so I'm, I'm going to try to give you like a three-minute introduction to coatings um, so that you can understand later on those things about differences between coatings and reactive programming. So um, uh, we, can, we can start with actually with that. Um, so coroutines in Kotlin, uh, they are created using suspending functions. A suspending function is a function which can suspend its execution. So it will start executing at, at some point, it can suspend its execution, and later on um, it can resume its execution. So to create a suspending function in Kotlin, you just add the suspend modifier. So, but how does it, how does it actually work um, underneath, under the hood? So if you create a suspending function like the one you see, the get user function, um, then the compiler, when it generates this function, it will generate a function with a slightly different signature. There will be an additional parameter of type continuation, which I called callback. And the return type of our function now is any, any is like an object in Java. And the reason the signature is different is that suspending functions are actually functions with callbacks. But you don't see this callback. It's not explicitly, um, you, you can't access it explicitly. Uh, but essentially what compiler does is it compiles your code the way, like if you would write your asynchronous code with callbacks, you would have to use those lambda expressions, nested callback, et cetera. You would have this callback help problem. But with Kotlin, with suspending functions, you write your code in a regular way. And the compiler does this whole thing of generation of those callbacks for you. But th there is like this one tiny difference between the, the regular callbacks approach and the, the, the one that is uh, used by the Kotlin compiler. So your suspending function can suspend its execution or it can just work uh, as usual and return the value directly. So it, if, it, if it doesn't suspend its execution, if it just wants to return a value, it, it will just return a value. This is why you have this any return type. But if your suspending function suspends its execution, you have to signal to the caller somehow that your function suspended its execution. And in that case, a special marker value called code in suspended will be returned and the true value of your function or an exception will be written via this callback, this continuation callback. The continuation is an interface. It has a one function, resume with, um, and you pass the result of your function to that resume uh, function call. So essentially it's callbacks, but it's not explicit callbacks, but they are created implicitly. Now, so, uh, the way you write your code with coatings is you actually write your regular code, regular Kotlin code. There is no special kind of code or the way you have to write your code uh, with coroutines. Just like you know, with reactive programming, you have to do it differently. So let's have a look at, at, a, simple, at a simple code with coroutines and with reactive programming. With coroutines, there is nothing th fancy about your code. Uh, it's a normal code, apart from this suspend modifier. With reactive programming, you have to decompose your code into two parts. Well, first of all, you have to decompose your code into those small functions. So you have to write it in a functional way. Whereas with co Kotlin coroutines, you can use imperative style. So with reactive programming, you decompose your code in a, in, in a functional way. And with reactive programming, you have those two parts um, of, your, of your code. The first one is the setup of a pipeline of operations that will be executed. And the second one is, happens when you subscribe to this pipeline. And the whole pipeline just starts being executed. The whole machinery starts being executed. And this is 
different from Kotlin coroutines. In Kotlin coroutines, you just write your code, code and it executes, suspending sometimes, waiting for some, uh, some uh, re uh, result of some operation. With reactive programming, you have these two phases of, of a setup of a pipeline and of the execution. So let, let's try to compare Kotlin coroutines and reactive programming um, in some situations, and let's try to see what is the difference, what's the advantage of one over the other, and when should we choose which one. Now, for this presentation, I had to choose one reactive programming library, and I chose Reactor. So Reactor is this library which is a backbone of Spring framework. So from Spring 5, from Spring version 5, it's like this, this um, Reactor is a major part of, of Spring 5. Um, it's very similar to other reactive libraries. So if you, if you used um, things like RxJava, then it, it may be familiar to you. But it has some nice features which are not available in those other um, reactive libraries, um, which are, are very handy. So let's try to see some sequential code. Um, so let's suppose we have a function get user, which gets some user data based on its user ID. And we have a function which is called get account, which receives some account data based on account ID. And you want to create a function which returns um, the, the account number uh, for a particular user. So we write your code, uh, we write, write our code in the usual way. With uh, reactive programming, uh, we have to decompose our, our code because our asynchronous functions that are like the regular functions, but they return those reactive types. Um, in Reactor, we have two reactive types, Mano and the Flux. Mano, which you can see here, is a, like the, the stream of zero or one value, or an exception. Um, so our asynchronous function uh, returns a Mano, uh, and our get account returns just directly a value. So if we want to write the get account number, the equivalent of, of the, the function that we've seen with coroutines, we have to use the map operator uh, so that we can work with the result returned by get user. Um, so it's not as, I mean, this code is not as nice as the one with coroutines. Um, and furthermore, if we want to, if you have to use a reactive library, we have to learn all those operators, all those functions which are defined on those reactive types. With Kotlin coroutines, you actually don't have to do that um, because you write your code with regular language construct. So now what happens if our get account function, which is right now it's a regular function, uh, if it's an asynchronous function? So in case of coroutines, we change the function to be a suspending function. And we actually don't have to change anything in our get account number function at all. So everything stays the same. We change the function from a blocking regular one to a, an, an asynchronous one, but we don't have to change the code that uses the function. With reactive programming, that's not as simple. So our get account function now returns a mano. It's an, a, a, now it's an asynchronous function. So it, our code will not compile. Our code of get account number function will not compile uh, because the, there is no account number attribute of a mano of account on an account. So we have to use map operator. But then we have a different problem. The code that you see here will not return a mano of a string, which should be the, the return type, but it will return a mano of a mano of a string. So we have to use a flat map. And this is something very important. If you do not know beforehand if your function is an asynchronous function or synchronous one or a blocking one, then with code, that doesn't really matter you can change your uh, function to be a suspending function at any time, and you don't have to change the places that use this function, those invocations. Whereas with reactive programming, you not only have to change the signature of your function, which now becomes asynchronous, um, you also have to change all those invocations and possibly the operators you use um, in your pipeline. So that's quite convenient for, for coroutines. Now, since we have asynchronous code, then um, it, 
probably will execute using th different threads because it will start using uh, it will start being executed using one thread, then it will suspend, and then it will resume with some other thread. So the question is, can we somehow uh, tell or specify what kind of threads um, we want to be used for those operations? And the answer is, of course, yes. But you redo it differently in, in coroutines and interactive programming. So with coroutines, um, there is a concept of a coroutine context, uh, which is assigned to a coroutine when it is being executed. And there is a special kind of coroutine context, which is called coroutine dispatcher, which is responsible for dispatching the execution uh, or on some thread. So it actually decides what kind of thread is used to execute a coroutine. And we can create our own coroutine context. So for example, let's suppose we want to have our own thread pool um, of, let's say, five threads, and we want to specify that our get user function uh, should, be, should be called using, uh, should be executed with the threads from this thread pool. So all we have to do is we have to create this code in context. There are a few ha handy um, functions for that in the Kotlin standard library. So one of them is new fixed thread pool context, where we will create a code in context with five threads in our case, and the threads will be named user one, user two, et cetera. And to specify that we want to use that context, we use with context function, where you specify what kind of context you want to, we want to use. Um, now let's suppose, so we have our get user name function here, which will use that custom context. Now let's suppose that we want to use that get user name function uh, and based on that name, you have to, we want to calculate the encryption key. But it takes quite a lot of time to calculate this key, so we also want to have a separate thread pool for doing that. So we, want, we may create a second code in context, a second thread pool, uh, which will be used only to execute this calculate encryption key function. And we use the same construct, we use the same with context function. So now the calculate the, the encryption key cal calculation will happen with the encryption um, context, and getting the user data will happen uh, with the usage of the user context that we've seen before. So how do you do it with reactive programming with Reactor? Now there is a, a similar concept to a code in dispatcher, which is called scheduler. So you can specify what kind of scheduler you want to use. Um, for the execution of your operations in, in your pipeline. So you can use subscribe on to specify what kind of scheduler is used for, for the, the, like this original operation, the source operation for your data, and for all those operations which are after that. Uh, so here we create our own scheduler. It's very similar to the one we've seen with um, coroutines. And, um, uh, and we subscribe on to specify that we want to use that. Now, if you want to have the same kind of behavior as with coding, so that the encryption happens on a different thread pool, we have to use publish on operator, where we specify a different scheduler. So there is like, uh, with coroutines, you have a uniform approach. You just use with context. With um, reactive programming, or essentially with reactor, we have to use either subscribe on or publish on. So the subscribe on will define where the, uh, the operations from the, the source operations till the first publish on should be executed. And the publish on will sh specifies um, what scheduler is used for the operations after publish on. So in our case, the calculate encryption key will happen using the encryption scheduler. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the concept itself, scheduler and coding Dispatcher, they are similar, but the usage of it, it's, it's a bit different. So now we have operations which are executed on different threads. And when we, I mean, before when we had operations executed in, in a single thread, um, a, common, a common pattern that was used was to use a thread local variables. So thread local variables, um, they are variables which are attached to a a thread, thread, 
so that, that you can set the variable at some point of your execution in, in some thread, and later on in, in a different part of your code, you can retrieve it, or you can even set it to a new value. Um, so it, it was used, or it is used, uh, for things like you know, security context, transactional context, or a request ID. Uh, it's, it's quite convenient, but we actually can't use it with coroutines or with um, reactive programming because we use different threads of execution for the same request. So how can we achieve th th this behavior, the, this functionality? So with, with coroutines, we can actually create a, con a coroutine context, so just, just like before we had a context which was a coroutine dispatcher for, which, which was used for dispatching um, the execution different, on different threads. There is, we can create a coding context which is based on the thread local, so that um, whenever our coding switches the thread of execution, that thread local, the value of that thread local will be preserved. So um, let's try with a simple example. Let's suppose we have a get user function, and, and uh, that get user is used by logging get user so that we log all the get user calls. Now, if we want to use this logging get user in our own function uh, and have this, func this request ID propagated, then we have to create this context. Uh, to create a context, you use the as context element extension function um, on a thread local. And now uh, this thread local can be, will be available um, on all, in all of the code which is uh, inside that with context. So that's pretty straightforward, and it's also nice because if you already have a library or if your program already uses thread local variables, you don't actually have to change anything. Um, it will work uh, as before. Now, with uh, Reactor, there is a similar concept, and this is actually one of the, the reasons I chose Reactor, because uh, in many libraries, uh, you don't have a, a concept of a, of a context of, of your uh, operations in, in your pipeline, and you have to do some tricks to actually achieve the same kind of thing. Uh, in a reactor, you have this um, first class concept, uh, which is a subscriber, con subscriber context. And to use that, um, we have to call subscriber context on the mano, which will retrieve the current context, which is set upon subscription to your pipeline. So uh, the subscriber context will actually return a mano of a context, so we have to use uh, a flat map to actually retrieve that. And uh, in, your, uh, in your code, where you define your pipeline and then you subscribe, you just specify the, the initial context value. So the context is like this key value map. That's a pretty straightforward concept. Um, you can, of course, get that value from some thread local variable. Uh, that, that's, that's like a normal code. Um, but then you have to use that subscriber context to retrieve it. So you, you, you can't actually um, access the thread local as you did with, uh, with um, coroutines. Um, now exception handling. So, so far we've had all those happy path scenarios. There were no exceptions in our code handled. So how do we do it with coroutines and with um, reactive programming? So with coroutines, we actually use regular language constructs. So we use try catch. That's like a, like a normal thing. Um, with Reactor, we have to use one of the operators which are which were created for handling exceptions. So for example, we can, we can use an error return where we specify the value that will be returned if there was any exception uh, thrown in your, in your pipeline of operations. Um, we can also use other operators, like um, an error resume or an, an error map um, for different scenarios. Um, the, the problem is you have to know all those operators. You have to all, know all the names and, and what they do, whereas with coroutines, you actually don't have to learn anything new. You just use uh, regular language constructs. So, if we have exceptions, we sometimes want to retry our operation because let's suppose our operation um, goes over a network to fetch some data and you know, network is unreliable. 
Um, so it may happen that for some time, some time it's not available. So we may want to try invoking, invoking, an, invoking an operation, and then if it fails, we may want to uh, wait for some time and try again. So with, um, with coroutines, um, we can do it with a simple loop where we try several times, and between the, 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 the trials, we just wait for some time. So we use, we use delay function here. Delay is like very similar to sleep, but sleep actually blocks the thread, um, whereas delay will not block the thread. It will just suspend the execution of the function. Uh, what we usually do is actually, if we have a polish like that, that uh, we want to try uh, invoking an operation a couple of times, and uh, we have this uh, policy about the time between consecutive trials, uh, we want to somehow extract that to, a, um, to some, some form, some, some abstraction. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward in Kotlin. Uh, we can define our own retry function, which will has these parameters, which say, okay, how many times do we want to retry? What's the initial time between retrials? And what's the, the operation that you actually want to invoke? And now our code uh, is a lot simpler. Now with uh, Reactor, the, there is an operator uh, specifically designed for retrying, which is called retry when. It takes as a parameter a function, which takes as a parameter a flux. So a flux is like this possibly infinite stream of values. Uh, it's a flux of exceptions or throwables. And it, uh, as a result, it provides a flux of longs. So the idea is that the, 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 the input flux of exceptions are those exceptions which come from your pipeline of operations. And uh, by providing the output flux, you can specify that, OK, I want to retry. Or if you just close the flux, so it, it's a finite flux, then you say, OK, I don't want to retry anymore. Uh, and since flux is the stream of values, it has this timing factor, then you can actually define your own policy for timing, just like we did with coroutines. So the equivalent policy um, to the one we've seen with coroutines written with Reactor is something like this. Now, I will not go and analyze that, that code, but you can see that it's, it's not as intuitive. It's, it's, it's pretty uh, complex. Um, but this is something you have to do if you want to do this. You have to, if, you, if you want to keep, actually define your own custom policy for retrying. There are some built-in uh, policies, uh, like with the exponential time. Um, you have you know, uh, an operator which is already written uh, in the part of Reactor. There are some libraries with some specific uh, policies. But if you want to have your own, then you have to write this kind of code um, yourself. So, so far, we've seen the sequential code. And um, this is actually where, where code things shine because they were designed for sequential code so that you can write it like a regular code. Now what happens with, when you have concurrent code? So when you have operations which, um, which work at the same time in, in a parallel. So let's suppose we have two functions, two asynchronous functions. One gets data about a user and the other one about the roles of a user. And you want to executed them concurrently, and then gathered the results and um, returned them uh, as a result of your function. So with coroutines, you have to use async um, coroutine builder. Async uh, will get as a parameter a lambda, uh, a suspending lambda. So you can call your suspending functions in that lambda. And the async will return a deferred um, of something. So a deferred is very similar. It's kind of like a promise type object. So if you think about things like computable future in Java, so it, it's very similar. Uh, the, the difference is that uh, with deferred, you have those uh, suspending functions like await, which will suspend the execution of your coroutine until there is a result of that deferred delivered. So what we do here is we actually start both of these coroutines, the, get, the one which executes get user, get user and get roles. They are started concurrently in the background thread, and then we wait for the result. And once the res both results are available, we just return a, a pair of user and roles. 
Now there is one thing here, which is the scope in scope. So essentially, the, this is a part of something which is called a structured concurrency and Kotlin coroutines. Um, basically, if you create a coroutine, there's always, uh, you may want to have uh, like a parent of this coroutine, and, and so you can have a parent of a couple of coroutines, and with coroutine scope, this coroutine scope will be this parent, and it will wait until all those coroutines are finished. Uh, by finished, I mean they either, either return some value if you use async, or they throw, throw an exception so that you will not end up with a coroutine which is running in a background thread and you don't even know about it because that would be quite dangerous. Uh, I mean, you could have things like you know, out-of-memory errors because you would have um, things running in, in the background and which you um, forgot about. But this coroutine scope actually plays also a different role so let's suppose that in this scenario, uh, the get roles fails almost, immedi almost immediately. And the get user, it takes a long time to execute. So what would happen normally is you would wait for a long time for that get user to be finished. And then you, will, you would call await for the get, on the get roles and you would get an exception. But the get roles fails almost immediately, so it would be nice if you could fail the whole thing almost immediately because um, you, th there is no way to actually uh, handle the, the, this. Um, to, so th there's no sense to actually wait for this get user. And this is what coding scope does. If any of the children um, of the of the coatings, which are children of the scope, if any of that fails then any await call that you see here will fail at this time. So it works like this. The, the coroutine scope will cancel all other coroutines. And by canceling, you usually handle them by, um, by throwing, a, throwing an exception. So this await on the user would also throw an exception. So you will have this fa fa fail fast uh, approach here. Now with Reactive programming, you have a, um, a similar uh, concept or a similar solution, and, and that's zipping. Uh, here I use, it, I use a, a zip width operator, which zips two manos or two streams of, 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 uh, of um, values, and um, you provide a function which takes those values that are delivered in those manos uh, and do something with it. So as you can see, this code is... I think it's simpler than the one with coroutines. So I started thinking, you know, um, I mean, let's try some different scenario and see how it, how it works. So my different scenario involves um, cancellation. So let's suppose that uh, we still have those get user and get roles functions. But the way it should work now is there is a flag on the user. And that flag tells us if the user is blocked or not. And if a user is blocked, then we actually don't care about the roles. We just want to return some empty roles. Um, so what we do is we actually wait for the user. And if that user is blocked, we cancel explicitly the coroutine which gets the roles. And then we just ret return the, the empty roles. And if the user is not blocked, then we just um, continue as, as normal. We wait for the, the roles. So the code is, is um, it's pretty straightforward if, if you try to read it. And um, I wanted to write the same kind of code with uh, reactive programming. So I asked two, the two different people, uh, which are way smarter than me and have a lot of experience with reactive programming. And I actually uh, came up with my own solution based on their solutions, which is this. Um, Probably, probably there, there is one which is better. I mean, probably you, you know reactive programming better than me. So uh, if you have any, any um, more elegant solutions, um, I'm happy to, to know about it. Uh, but um, it, it struck me that it's very unintuitive to write that kind of code uh, for this particular scenario. Um, so with coroutines, I didn't really have to think about, you know, what, how can I structure it? What should I do? I just wrote it. With reactive programming, with Reactor, um, that wasn't uh, as easy. 
Um, now we have con we had concurrent code, and uh, now let's try the parallel code. So by parallel code, I mean that we have the same operation for different arguments, different values of, of arguments. So let's suppose we have a get user uh, function, which returns, returns the user data, and we have get user IDs, which returns user IDs for for some account. And now we, we have to, we want to combine them. So with Kotlin, that, that's pretty straightforward. We first get the user IDs, then we launch um, however many coroutines we have to, I mean, the, for, for each user ID, we launch a coroutine uh, with async, so we get the list of deferred, and then we can use a very useful function defined in the Kotlin library, which is called the wait all, which will await for all those deferred values and will return a list of users. That, that, so that, that's like pretty, pretty straightforward as well. Um, with uh, reactive programming, we can, we have to, actually with Reactor, we have to convert that mono of a list that we have into a flux, uh, so that then we can flat map and then convert back a list of, um, uh, a, a flux of users to a, mo to a mono of, you of a list of users. Now, that's not, not what we would normally do, of course, we would use flux and with Flux, the code is much simpler. So Flux, as I mentioned before, is this um, possibly infinite stream of values. So let's talk about streams. Um, in Kotlin coroutines, there is a concept which is similar to streams, which is called channel. So we have receive channels and send channels. We, receive, we can receive values from the channel and send values. Now, let's suppose our function get users now, instead of returning a list of users, it returns a uh, receive channel of users. So receive channel has this receive function. It's a suspending function. So it means that there is this timing factor, like with flux. Um, there is this timing factor present uh, that allows you to do almost the same thing as with, with Rocket programming. So, uh, let's suppose we want to print these users, the names of these users. So we just loop um, infinitely and call receive that when there is a value or a user in that receive channel, we just get it and we print the name. When the receive channel is closed, then the receive function will throw an exception, but that's not really nice. What we can do is we can use a receive or null um, function which is very similar, but it will just return a null value when the channel is closed. Um, and there are also some convenient functions like consume each, which will allow you to, um, to traverse, traverse all the, the receive channel and um, execute some code for each of the, of the value which is in that channel. Um, the equivalent code with, uh, with Reactor, it's um, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You subscribe to, you, to your flux and do something um, in, in this lambda that you pass to subscribe. Now, there is one important thing you have to know about receive channels, and generally channels um, in Kotlin. So in interactive programming, there's this concept of hot stream and a cold stream. So a hot stream is um, you actually have those values in some streams, uh, in some stream delivered all the time. And when you subscribe to the stream, you will get the values since the, the, this moment of time that you subscribed. If you unsubscribed, the values are delivered to other subscribers. Of the, if there are no subscribers, then they are not delivered to anyone at all. But the, the, this um, delivery of values, it happens all the time. Uh, with cold stream, until you subscribe to a reactive stream, nothing really happens. When you subscribe, then some machinery starts, some process starts to be executed and, and it delivers those values. Now here we have, uh, with, co with coatings, we have this get users function which returns this receive channel. And th there is some process, some coating, which sends values to that channel. And that coating does not actually know there is someone on the receiving side. So essentially channels in, coating, in Kotlin coatings are hot channels if we I want to distinguish between cold and hot. They are hot. There is no concept of, of a cold stream or a cold channel, at least not yet. So this is something that the 
Kathleen Coatin team is actually working on right now. There are some preliminary um, things available. Uh, so if you're interested, you can, you can, you can Google it, Google it um, or uh, probably the best way to, to, to find it is um, to go to a GitHub um, account for, for the coatings and there are some um, issues created and some sample code. But right now, um, we only have hot streams or hot channels. So how do we generate, how, how do we create such streams? With um, Kotlin coatings, um, we create a, a channel using a channel function and then we create a code in which sends the values to that channel. So here we use a launch code in builder. Launch, uh, it's supposed similar to async, but async returns a deferred of something. So it's expected that it will return some value. Launch is not expected to return any value. It just launches a code in which runs in the background thread. And that, that code in will send the values to the, the channel that you created. In fact, this pattern is so common that there is a special function, which is called produce, which will do both. So it will create a coating and it will create a channel and return that channel as a, as a return value of this produce function. So you can use send and you can close channels directly using, using, using those functions. Um, now for flux, there is a couple of ways to actually generate flux. Um, the simplest one is to use generate function where you are provided with synchronous sync. I think it's synchronous. Um, where you can call functions which deliver the values um, on that flux using this sync. So you can call next, so you can com use complete to signal that th this is the end of the flux. Um, so reactive libraries are well known for their usage of operators. So there's like tens or maybe hundreds of operators defined for mano or flux. Um, and there is a similar concept for coroutines or essentially for channels. So the, uh, these functions that you see here, filter not or map, they are actually extension functions. So in Kotlin, there is this concept of extension function where you can say that a type can, uh, a type can have an additional function which was not def defined at the time that, that this type was, was created. Um, so you can add your own functions to an existing type, essentially. And this is the way it's done for receive channel. Um, so uh, there is like a number of those um, functions or operators on receive channels um, in the Kotlin library. The difference between, because you have essentially the same thing or similar thing with reactive library. The difference is that the the operators or the functions for Kotlin coroutines, they actually create a coroutine which runs in the background thread and waits for the values from the upstream channel and transforms it somehow uh, and pushes the value to the downstream channel. Now, when I say running, I don't mean that there's like a thread which constantly, constantly awaits for the values because here we have suspending functions all the time. So it's suspending functions when, when they are suspended, they do not consume a thread only when they are resumed and they, when they are unsuspended, they will execute on some thread. Um, and, you know, um, reactive programming libraries are well known for the fact that it's quite difficult to define your own operator. With Kotlin coroutines, that's pretty straightforward because you have channels, you can create, you can get the upstream channel, you can create a downstream channel, and you define your own coaching, which does all the, the logic that you want. Um, so like here, for example, we have a filter map operator, uh, which takes as a parameter a function, which when, when, when the, the function returns a null value, then we just don't send anything to the downstream channel. And um, if it's not a null value, we just, we just, it just acts as a map. Now, I, I, I will not show you the code, the equivalent code for filter map um, with Reactor because, well, first of all, I'm, was, I'm not really able to write that kind of code. 
Um, but I actually took a look at the existing code for operators like filter or Ma or, uh, the map operator, and it's like a couple of hundred of lines of code. So that, that, that's, um, that's pretty big. Um, so with reactive libraries, the, there is this concept of back pressure when the, the consumer or the downstream, uh, it can signal, you know, how many, uh, how many elements can it consume from the upstream so that it will not be um, overflowed with, with too many things that it can't handle. Now with coroutines, uh, that's a back pressure and with channels, back pressure is quite natural. So I mentioned that when you send a value to a channel um, and when you receive a, va a value from a channel, these functions are suspending functions. And the way they, use, they, um, they by default work is that if you send the value to a channel and there is no one on the receiving side, that send will be suspended. So you will not be able to send anything else until, or the send will actually be suspended, so it will not resume until there is a receiving side and someone receives that value. And the other way around, if you receive value from a channel and no one sent any value, then you will just, your code will be suspended until there is some value in that channel. So there's like this natural back pressure. We don't have to do anything special to have that back pressure. But sometimes you want this back pressure policy to be different. So the, the, the default one is called rendezvous, and you actually, you actually defined what kind of back pressure you want to have by uh, passing the, uh, the, uh, the special argument um, value for your channel function, which creates a channel. So the default one is rendezvous. Um, sometimes you want to have a buffer channel, so that, uh, like for example, if you pass five as a, as, a, as a parameter of channel, then you will be able to send five values, and when you try to send the sixth value and there is no one receiving these values, then at this point it will suspend. So you have the first five, you will be, will be just buffered. Um, in memory. Um, you can use unlimited, buff, uh, unlimited channels, so essentially you will have an unlimited buffer, which means that you can, I mean, your send function will never be suspended, but then you can get an out of memory error at some point if you don't receive the values um, um, you know, fast enough. And there is the conflated channel. The conflated channel works like this. If you send a value to a conflated channel and there is a receiving side, it receives that value and it processes that value. Now, if, if during that pro processing you send a couple of values, then when the receiving side receives something from the channel again, it will only see the last value that you sent. So uh, that, that's um, very similar to, watch, to one of the back pressure strategies. Uh, because this is essentially equivalent to the back pressure strategies you have in, in Reactor. Um, and um, it's, it's sometimes useful because you are, you might be only interested in the, let's say, current or the last value in, in, your, in your channel. Um, um, so we've seen that we, we can do some things better in, um, with Kotlin coroutines and some things are better with... Um, reactive programming, so the question is how can we somehow combine both of these solutions? So let's talk a bit about interoper interoperability. So there are those um, functions or extension functions which allow you to use both of these solutions to mix them. So for example, let's suppose you have, a, have, an, an, you have an asynchronous function which retains a mano, and we want to use this, uh, this function in a code which uses coroutines. So there is a number of extension functions defined on a mano, like for example, wait first or null, which will wait for this mano to define the value, to deliver the value, or return a null value if that mano is a stream of zero values, or it will throw an exception if that mano uh, essentially returns an error. Um, and this extension function is a suspending function, so you can easily use it in your coroutines, uh, in, your, in your code which uses coroutines. And there's a number of those functions defined on the mano. 
um, which have uh, different semantics. And the other way around, if we have a suspending function and we want to define our own function which returns this reactive type, then we can use a coroutine builder called mano. So just like there was a coroutine builder async which returned the re deferred when you, when you could pass a, a code, a, a suspending lambda as a parameter, here you can pass a suspending lambda as a parameter to this mano function and it will return a mono. And then you can use in that, in that lambda any kind of suspending function you, you want to use. And the same thing is for flux and channels. So if you have a flux, a, a function which returns a flux, um, and you want to work with channels, you can c call the open subscription function, which will actually create a channel and um, send the values from the flux to that channel. Um, you just have to remember to close that channel on the receiving side because that's the only the only um, way. You, um, because otherwise, you you will get some resource leak. And uh, the same thing applies for the other way around. So if you have a function which uh, which returns a receive channel and you want to have a function which returns flux, that's perfectly possible as well with the flux um, coroutine builder. So the question is, what should we use? Um, coroutines or reactive programming? So for sequential code, I think coroutines are better. So coroutines were designed for sequential code. And you don't have to write your code in a functional way like you do with reactive programming. Um, with concurrent code, it actually depends on the kind of code you have. If it's a simple one, then probably um, reactive programming is a bit better. If there is a slight complexity in your code, like we've seen in the scenario, um, then it may be better to actually use coroutines. Um, channels, they have the restrictions. They're always hot, and it may not be something that you want. And they are experimental, which means that because we actually have to wait for the cold streams or cold channels to be um, designed and implemented. Uh, that means that the, the channels themselves, the APIs are marked as um, experimental because they may change, they will probably change um, quite significantly, probably. Um, and at the end of the day, you, can, you have to remember that you can mix both solutions to get the best of either of it. So if you want to, um, get some more information. There are two great documents uh, about coroutines and reactive programming. The first one, Guide to the Reactive Streams with Coroutines. Um, it's uh, specially targeted at reactive streams and coroutines um, comp comparison, interoperability. Um, so it's, it's very, very nicely written. Um, the second one is like the general guide to coroutines. Um, and, but it's also very well written, and you can, there, there you can learn more about coroutines in general. Okay, so that's all from me for today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. There's a microphone here. Um, okay. Yeah, so the question was about Scala for comprehensions. I'm not really familiar with Scala, so uh, I'm not really able to answer that question. So any other question? Okay. Right. Okay. So the question was about uh, fibers and the, it's actually called Project Loom. Uh, yeah. So it's one of the things which are happening in, in, as a JEP, I can't remember the name. 
the, the, the number um, in Java, um, where you have fibers. Um, so it's, I mean, the concept itself is similar because the, we have, let's say, coroutines as well there. Um, so it's, and right now the, this, this um, project loom, it's um, not mature enough. So I think it will probably take two or three years before we can see it in OpenJDK. And then we can actually talk about how similar it is to coroutines because the, there is some initial design right now but it probably will change. So the, I think the idea is that you will, the, the coroutines with fibers and with Project Loom, they will be even less, um, you, you will not actually notice them in your code. So you will probably, there will probably no, not gonna be a special keyword like with coroutines in Kotlin. We have this suspend modifier. Um, the, the guy who actually does the project loom is, um, has done before a library called Quasar where, uh, where uh, you were able to write sort of code, an asynchronous code or code with coroutines, but with Java, with some exception handling, special stuff. Um, so I think we have to wait a bit to see the final design before we can actually say how it compares to Kotlin coroutines. Okay, I think we're out of time. So if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer them after the talk. Thank you.